Hello, everyone. Welcome to this talk, Python meets UX, enhancing user experience with code, presented by Neuraja Bande. If you have any question, please feel free to type it on Slido. OK, let's give a warm round of applause to the speaker, Neuraja. Thank you so much. Uh, this is good. Perfect. So welcome. This is Python meets UX, enhancing user experience with code. So in this presentation, we'll be exploring the synergy or the intersection between AI and the UX. We'll see how Python can be used to, as a powerful toolkit to enhance the user experience design and people like the UX designers can just like incorporate those in their user like daily activities. Throughout this presentation, we will be looking at the importance of UX in the digital landscape and the role of Python in it. We'll also be looking at the Python can be, how Python can be implemented in the UX as a different life cycle, falling by data mining to automation to A-B testing. And eventually we will end up with summarizing everything into an hybrid e-commerce uh, case study we'll be preparing by using Python and UX design. So to begin with, uh, we start with like, what exactly is UX and why is it important? So we all know like UX is very crucial for understanding the human behaviors. No, no worries. And we start with something like a discover phase where we gather all the information we have from multiple different sources and we accumulate them at a different, uh, at a specific place. Then we define our proposition on top of it, like what could be the what could be the possible solutions we have, and once we have defined those solutions, we go with the ideation phase, where we are ideating on the initial ideas on the brainstorming sessions, and once we have those initial uh, ideation session being done, we go with the design phase, where we are designing the initial. Uh, prototype or tool or whatever you're working on based on the initial user testing and all. And once it's ready, we go with the usability testing and see if it's a market fit or if it's not, we reiterate and go back. So we'll see like uh, AI and UX has a lot in common because both focuses on gathering a lot of data and finding insights on top of it. And this is, beca this is important because we'll see like almost 77% of the devices we're using uses some sort of an AI in some form of the other. And the problem is like the current scenario is UX teams takes hours to work on something to create maybe a prototype or the initial version of, of, the, uh, of the product. It's the same thing can be done by an AI models which uses a large amount of data in a fraction of minutes. So we'll see like how this intersection can be quite user friendly and hence enhance the customer retention and revenue for the companies. So to understand this intersection, we'll be starting with the data processing. Like as we know, like from AI and ML, data is like gold, data is so crucial. Similarly for the UX processes, data is very crucial as it allows like users to get, the teams to get insights about the user behavior by getting their feedbacks or uh, maybe some sort of like queries or forms or anything, but like helps them make decisions which are not just assumptions but are data-driven decisions. Then we'll see like traditionally uh, the, the way UX designers work is like they spend hours to gather some information and then form some inference on top of it. We'll see like why Python can use for the same purpose to analyze data across multiple different sources from forms to historical data and help us find out the pain points for the users. So with the AI models, we'll see like how we can also get these uh, user patterns and behaviors, how the users are behaving, and we can go with a personalized touch in the products. Uh, quick example will be the click clickstream data, like if you know like the how the user uh, navigates onto a platform on a website, we can then identify some user pain points, what are the bottlenecks and where exactly the user is just like getting out of the funnel. And then only we can make some targeted decisions on the product. And the last thing is like UX designers do a lot of tedious tasks which delays the production speed because they collect a lot of data, create user personas, pain points, patterns and everything. But like, uh, 
which also caused like engineering failures eventually and a lot of extra time has been taken up. So we'll see like how we can cut it down by use of Python. And to summarize, we can say like, they can streamline the process, help the designers and the users all together. The second big aspect is like personalization. Users don't want something which is too generic these days. So everyone wants something which is too personalized because the generic works are going outdated now. And AI offers like UX designers to have an efficient and accessible way to create those highly customized uh, personas and the user experience with vast amount of data which is available out there. And you use this like in uh, everyday life from music streaming apps to every social media you're working on. And the second thing is like the behavioral data, which is like how we can find patterns on the user behavior, like what exactly they're doing and how we can customize it. Because normally what UX designers are doing is like they are talking to the customers, they are using some tools, they're using some, doing extensive usability testing, which is taking so much of time. And we can think of something like when you go to an e-commerce website, you will see like how we can analyze the historical data of the user purchase history and we can just like formulate new uh, personalized recommendations to you. Maybe you, you have used Alibaba, Amazon and all these companies. And the third one is like the predictive analysis, which is like AI can is well worse when identifying patterns in users' performances. And the main thing which can help us is like finding bottlenecks, like where exactly the bottlenecks are or the hotspots are. And then we can tailor the experiences for the user. Again, the clickstream is a big example which can further formulate into A-B tests, which we'll be seeing later in the slides how we can do that. And the last one is like real-time data analysis. This is one thing UX designers lack the most. What if some drastic change happens, some new user group just like come to your platform, or what, can you, what are you gonna do? You have to do the same thing again, those five iteration process from the beginning. So what we can do is like we can base on the location, the diversity, we can make immediate necessary changes, like something like internalization, and therefore we can enhance the user experience. So to conclude this, uh, I would say, it doesn't only enhances the UX, but like by providing personalized content, but like also help the designers to make some data-driven decisions, which are not just assumptions. So this is uh, one last aspect before we go to the case study is like the automation of UX task because there's so many tasks like people are doing their huge number of teams who are working on the UX aspect of a product, and like in a in a, in a traditional way. Everything is manual because I personally have worked as a UX designer before, I've worked with UX teams. It's a lot of tedious task, it's time consuming, it's less efficient I would say, and as I said, it, it leads to engineering delays. So with the AI incorporation, we can see like, uh, we can make these tasks, if not fully automated, at least semi-fully automated, which will enhance the efficiency of the product. And with the addition of processes like A-B testing and all, we can, together formulate the uh, ideas which are efficiently done and more with data. So the last thing I want to talk about is like the cost, the money involved in this. Like when you have so much of people, human work is involved, it costs a lot of, it, it costs a lot basically. And the engineering failures is on top of it. So by automating these tasks like affinity diagramming and creating user personas, we can cut down those costs and make the product more user friendly. So we'll see this thing by putting up all the things we have seen before into a case study. The proposition will be enhancing user experience for the hybrid e-commerce store. Let's assume we'll be setting up now an e-commerce store which will be working in both offline and online setting. And Let's name it Pi Shoes because it's for Pythonistas like us. And we'll solve all those issues with a data-driven strategy. So we'll see like how this uh, intersection can not only serve the customer in a better way, but also help the UX designer fix the bottlenecks and increase the revenue. So yeah, so let's start with data mining for the UX insights. So for all those who doesn't know what data mining is, it's like a simple process for finding the insights from large data sets and just like influencing something out of it. So in the UX perspective, 
it will be something like we're getting some crucial insights about the user behavior. It could be the user navigation patterns, purchasing patterns, or anything similar to that. And we are thereby doing something like, the we are just like enhancing the traditional way into a better way. So the next thing will be the user segmentation. We can also segment use into different groups based on their, again, the purchasing history or the browsing history and all. And we can also make use of the user feedback coming from not only the websites or the uh, one-on-one interaction. We can also get the data from multiple different sources, which the UX designers lack in doing right now because they might do it, but like it's a tedious process again. And they can gather those uh, feedbacks and we can enhance the, like we can find the pain points and enhance the user experience. So if you talk about the user segmentations, we'll see like how we can create a personalized experience because what we can do is like we can cater different sections of user groups at the same times with their own different needs. And in this example for this, we'll be thinking of something like a simple k-means clustering algorithm, which is like an unsupervised uh, machine learning algorithm, which basically does uh, something very simple, clusters similar groups into together based on their feature similarity or something like a browser history as we discussed before. So if you see here, you'll see we have like four clusters for the user transaction data, which we are putting them uh, together based on their feature similarity. So with this, what we can do is like we can personalize content for them and we can also create personalized promotions, which is quite important for the marketing purposes for these companies. And everything we are providing to the user will be according to the needs, quite tailored. The second thing in, uh, is customer feedback. So this is a very crucial thing in the user experience design because we rely a lot on how the user is behaving and how user is giving us the feedback. So it can help us uh, find some recurring patterns and concerns about the products or the tool we're working on. And it also helps us gain some valuable insights about the products and the user world that like be our user groups. And also it helps us to find the pain points directly and so that like we can use those pain points, create pain point prioritizer based on specific segments and then cater them directly. So for this example, we can simply use something like very simple sentimental analysis, like how the sentiments of the feedbacks are working. Either is it positive, negative or neutral? And thereby we can see at what pain points they're contributing to and therefore we'll make changes in the next iteration and make the product better. So if you have a large number of reviews on say on your website which says like slow shipping, and you can say like, oh, there's a, there's a huge negative sentiment happening here and in the next iteration, shipping is the one important thing which has to be done here. The second important technique is the uh, clickstream, uh, sorry, the navigation patterns, which is basically how a user navigates onto your platform. So by this, what you're gonna get is like, we're gonna get the insights and the bottlenecks, uh, the uh, hotspots like where we are losing customers. And again, you, you get those pain points out of this and the area of uh, consider consideration or the confusion where people are having. And thereby you can use this information and update the next iteration and fix the needs of the user. So we'll see this later, how we can use the A-B testing and incorporate this navigation patterns and just like do some uh, do some things which will be helpful for the users. So let's assume, let's assume we were in an online setting before. Now we have also opened something like an offline store. And now the things will be a little different, but like they'll be pretty much the same. We'll have some problems like uh, item set placement, how the user experience will be on the platform. If there will be stockouts, how are we gonna deal with them? Or if you want to cater some promotions and discounts, do we need some specific marketing team for this or not? So we'll make use of the online store insights we had before, and we'll make use here in our off, uh, offline setting. So one of the very important thing which we use in data mining is called market basket analysis. We use the user's um, transaction data or the entire transaction data of the store and find the items which are brought frequently together. We can also do customer segmentation here on top of it like we discussed before. We can segment them based on their behavior which will lead to like targeting marketing tactics, efforts and personalization. 
And we can also optimize the store layout, which is a very crucial thing. Like this is something you must have seen. Like if you go to a supermarket and you, to buy some egg and bread, and if you find some bread alone, you are, you're more likely to just leave the store and go to the other one and buy bread, butter, and eggs all together. So this is where you're losing customers, and this is where we use a lot of data mining techniques like market basket analysis to optimize the store layouts, where to put the item placements, and this can also be uh, also helps you reduce the stockouts. And the last one is the inventory management. This is where your stockouts thing come up because here you will be talking about like listening to a lot of historical data or a lot of historical customer feedback for trends and popular things because something will happen like if it's a season of Christmas, people are most likely to buy a lot of stuff which you might be lacking because suddenly there will be a boom in the increase of sales. So this can help you figure out like what could be the prediction for this next Christmas season into my store. So what we're doing here is like we're creating some associations for placements. So initially what we're doing is like we are pre-processing uh, using one heart encoding. We're creating the binary columns for each column, which is basically one indicates that there's a presence of an item. And then what we're doing is we're computing the frequent item sets. So we're not calculating the entire uh, a priori algorithm by ourselves. We're just like simply using the a priori library, which gives us a set of items that occur together in a transaction. So there'll be <coughs> high frequency item set. We have to cut it short, like what kind of item sets we need, what's the range of it. Then there is a minimum support, which is the value, which means like um, at least this percent of items should appear together. Then what we're doing is like when we have those list of items, we're generating the association rules. So which means like what are the frequent item sets we generated? Then what is the likelihood of, of those items being purchased together? Because we know there, there are so many items we have linked together. Now we have to calculate the likelihood. Okay, there should be a ratio which is the top and which is the bottom. And then we filter out those rules which are basically lift and confidence. So you will see higher the lift, the more better the solution is because uh, confidence is basically uh, the probability of rule being true and lift measures how much or how likely the items in a, in a, like a rule are bought together. So we don't just rely on support and confidence because sometimes it could be something like if A and B items are bought together, we just like created a sample set out of it and they, must, they might be possible that B is, is an item which is always bought by most of the people. So we always uh, look at the lift value, which gives us a very good uh, idea, idea of like how these idea, like item sets are together compared to like bought randomly. And yeah, and then we just like uh, print out like the high highly item sets based on the lift. And if you see like, if we just like run this algorithm, like run this, uh, form, run this uh, function, we'll see we get these uh, top six shoes and uh, we, we see their support and confidence and lift and the highest the lift, uh, the better is the association we're getting. And as we discussed earlier, Python can also be used for automating these tasks, which includes your web scraping and all. And automating multiple tools can take a lot of human efforts because sometimes there's also a need, something like you're using 10 of those tools manually and what's happening is like, then you have to create another, use another tool to create and workflow automation on top of it. Just like you people use Zapier and all those tools. So, you can simply, instead of those like doing those tasks one by one, you can make use of Python, create your own pipelines, and just like automate this entire thing. So they, they might be also an issue when we talk about like the reviews and all, like most of the times those reviews are not coming directly from your own platform, it's not your own e-commerce website. So let's assume like in our e-commerce store, we're getting a lot of these um, reviews from external website, like the third party websites. So what we're gonna do is like, we can directly web scrape them, like scrape them out from those websites. And we can use multiple ways. You can use a lot of things. Python has so many different libraries, like powerful libraries, like Scrapey, Beautiful Soup, and Selenium. And you just get those data out of it, get bone insights, and just like pull them back. We discuss like sentiment analysis, or find some common trends out of it. So we can also synthesize all the data in one frame, in like um, a data frame kind of a thing. 
Then we can also create something like an affinity mapping, which is like a very crucial aspect of UX processes. You might have seen like UX designers just like sticking notes and just like creating th those affinity diagrams. And these things can be automated now using NLP and large language models, and which can therefore quickly help them find the pain points and recurring themes on top of it. And then we can visualize the results and draw conclusions on top of it. And this will give us a more data-driven strategy than just manually doing something which is very tedious. Okay, so we talk about the A-B testing now. So it's a simple thing. It's just like comparing two or more variations all together and seeing like which one performs better. So this is something we can do statistically than just like manually doing some of the things. I mean, even the UX is gonna use some sort of tools for this. And what it helps is, is like it's gonna help with user interfaces. Losing customers can be figured out and it, it can improve the conversion rates. So we'll see like how we can use the Matt Whitney test and the button color test in the next slides. And the process of doing this is like, you, can, you don't even have to do it on, on your own. There are so, so many great libraries by Google, like the Google Analytics, which has a Python API. You just like use it, it gives you the page clicks and the time spent. So let's assume we have used those libraries and found some information on the page clicks and all. So what we're doing is like, we're trying to do an A-B testing here. So we have group A and group B, which are giving you the, uh, the conversion rates. And what we're now doing is like we're performing a t-test. T-test is like a statistical, a statistical test. So we use the t-test uh, in function from the SciPy stats to calculate the t-test values and the p-values from the given sample. We then determine the significance and by setting an alpha value, which is like a, a threshold value we're using here, or the significance level value, or the significance level, I would say. And if the p-value is like less than 0 0.05, it indicates like there's a significant difference in the two groups. And if it's not, we can say like, oh, there's no significant difference in the two groups, so let's not change anything. And we can also do something like if you're changing some buttons on your website, we can do uh, a button color test. It's a simple process. You take the CTR, the click-through rate, you create the contingen uh, <coughs> contingency table, and what you are doing next is like you're calculating the chi-square test, which is like uh, another statistical method which used to determine uh, whether there's a significant change or significant association between two categorical values which we'll be using. And then we have the p-test here, which we're also getting using the chi-square contingency table, which means like there's a measure against a null hypothesis. And in our case, the null hypothesis is simply like uh, whether there's a conversion between those two uh, versions or whether there is no con there's no change, it's just because of a chance. Because there's a huge possibility like you just made a change and there was a, like a, it was a coincidence, just happened. So you have to figure this thing out and chi-square test is gonna help you out. So when you will be running it, we'll see like there's a significant difference between group A and B. The CTR of A was 10% and the CTR of B was 12% and the p-value was 0 0.02. So the lower the value, like around 0 0.02 means like there was a significant difference. And if the p-value is quite high, we can say like, oh, it was just a chance. So in our case, it actually worked. The button changing of color actually increased our conversion rate. Now we'll be talking about navigation menu, which we discussed earlier as well. We'll be seeing like if reordering the value of the navigations can affect the time the user takes. Uh, so there's a simple statistical test called Man Whitney test. It determines whether two groups, which we are uh, two groups of data, come from the same population or not. So what we are doing here is like we are just like uh, creating two uh, data frame with the page views, bounce rate, and the average time, and checking like whether there's a difference between the average time uh, a person like uh, spend on a page and what's the bounce rate of the two groups and how they are like significantly different. So we are just like calling the man Whitney function, passing the group A and group bounce value and the average return page. And when we run this, we will see like the U statistic of, uh, of the first class is like 25 and the second one is 0 0.5. So we can say like the smaller the U statistic, then it's less likely that the thing which has occurred was just by chance or coincidence. So with this huge difference, we can see like the change which has happened, which was not very much, but you will see it's it's not a huge difference, but like that create a very significant change in the conversion rates and all. 
And yeah, the last thing we'll be discussing is like how we can create those personalized user experiences. So we can uh, implement something like uh, a user-based collaborative filtering and the content-based collaborative filtering for this, which can enhance like tailoring promotions or something for the users. If you're running a campaign or just like adding some new values to your website, so now what we're doing is like we are simply saying like, hey, if there's a user A, uh, user one, two, or whatever user we're looking at, what's the products we should be recommending to that user? So we're creating a sample data set, which is just a small data set we have created with various products represented as a dictionary. We then provide the uh, data frame to create a user product matrix, where those uh, represent users and columns represent the products. And the cell values represent to the corresponding ratings, which is on the scale of one to five. And then what we are doing is like we are finding the cosine similarity. This is something you guys must know if you have worked with NLP and text classification and all. So we are just like finding the similarity between two vector space, uh, two vector inner space. And then what we're doing is like we are finding a target, which is like that your customer is target user is two. And then we are finding the most similar user by using the NP arc max, which is helping us uh, for the user uh, similarity metrics here. And then what we are doing is like we are simply uh, identifying the products rated by the most similar uh, uh, users, but not by the target users. And once we are done with the differences we are getting from the set of rated, uh, the rated products for both users, we can generate an outcome that this will be the recommended products for user. Uh, so in our case, for the user two, it should be B and C. And similarly, we can do something like a content-based collaborative filtering. For example, if there's a product A, which is something like milk, then what similar products will be there? Like if it's yogurt or something. So we figured out something with creating a TF-IDF vectors to transform the descriptions of the uh, the idea we're getting, like the descriptions. And once we create this TF IDF matrix, this will be holding all the importance of each word, which, which, which you're getting from the description, basically. And then we take into account the frequency by which they are just like coming in the data frame. Then we simply compute the same uh, cosine similarity. Uh, we create this by using a linear kernel matrix with bypassing the, the IDF, TF IDF matrix. And now what we're doing is like this this current matrix um, will be representing the similarity between all the pairs of shoes uh, we are just like showcased as a product. And then we define a recommendation function which is taking the products uh, which is which is taking the products indexes and the similarity matrix and returns the most similar products we're getting by looking at the cosine similarity score. So for example, if you're going with the recommendation for A, which is the, the zero index of a product, we'll see it will be something like a sneaker and a formal shoes. So, so all together when we have performed all those things and we are planning to go for the new iteration on the product, we need something like a user persona. And when we conclude, we will see like we can say like the personal recommendation based on pricing and purchasing history has given us some data driven insights on what these this set of user needs. And with the AI powered A-B testing, this results has led to an optimized user interface and better store navigation, which will be helping us uh, retain those customers so that they keep coming up. And we also find out like, oh, there, there were, these are the main pain points which are called frustrations here. Like, this set of user group was not able to find the relevant product, so we need to work on more associations so that like there's no stock out in anything. And if there's an inconsistent experiences between online and offline channel, we, we need to make sure it doesn't happen again. And the time consuming navigation and search processes was there, so we need to fix it. So overall, we can say like, oh, we, 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 with the just a data driven process, we don't have to create those manual approaches and we can overall just using the data which is coming from the actual platform, we can make some further decisions on the new iteration. So yeah, this is how you use Python into your UX design workflows and enhances user experience. And thank you so much, and if you have any questions, let me know.
Okay, thanks for Neurology's insightful talk. We have got a few minutes for Q&A session now. Hello, let me show you the screen. Okay, just, just give me one second. Okay, it's here, can you see it? Uh, it's visible, right? But it's not visible to me. Uh, just, so, no, let's. Oh, this will be now it will be visible to me as well. <laughs> so, oh, okay. Perfect. So based on the market basket analysis model, have you ever observed any interesting product pairs such as beer and diaper? Well, there there are always the things. So <coughs> this is what I said, like when you only uh, rely on the support values or the confidence, there's a high chance you will get all these kind of values, like which are so drastic because diaper is something. If you're in Germany, suppose you're in Germany, even if you're going to buy diapers, you're so, you just love beers. You will always buy beer with everything. So that, that'll be a very uh, negative assumption of saying like, oh, there's diaper and beer are something which are always bought together because it's just because beer is some a very common thing which people are buying all the way. So this is this is where you don't just rely on those support values and you also take into account the lift values and all the all these statistical tests on top of it. So based on the, okay, when, when doing A-B testing for two groups, will you separate user by same distribution to make sure user pool is similar or directly random set of two groups? Okay, so what we're doing is like, it's better to have the similar structure, like, uh, the distribution should be same because otherwise what will happen is like uh, the, 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 the percentage probability we are getting will be quite different because we not, we, or maybe sometime if you're taking the percentage probability then, then it, I think it just do, doing anything randomly is fine. But if you're taking into some sort of like you're using some other metrics, I don't know which metric you're using for this thing, there are so many metrics we can use then definitely use a single like similar s uh, sample set of users or user pool. Do you think it's okay to set two uh, me metrics, register rate and subscribe rate in the same page as evaluation metrics? Um, what do you mean by register rate? Is it like uh, user registration on the platform? Okay, I don't know who asked this, but like, if it's the user registration on the platform, um, I, I'm not sure if it's a good metric. Uh, may, maybe you can do it like as a, but it's again, it's again follows something like that comes in the end. Like you will, you are trying to find the funnel where people are just like you're losing customers. So if you're just like adding this uh, metric as a register rate, I don't think it's a very good metric. But like subscribe rate is a very good metric for the A/B testing. And it again uh, loops back to like how exactly you are just like asking the user to subscribe because it depends on a way or method. If you're just like adding a subscribe button at the end of your website or something, obviously there's a very high low chance. You need to fix that before just like taking those metrics into account. Is there any better? Uh, I mean, elbow method is like the most commonly used, but again, it depends on the outcomes like in machine learning. It's most of the times it's something like some data models, some, some kind of data models will give you a better approximation. Like uh, if you're using something like a very small, let's not say just like the K-means or some other machine learning model, like sometimes logistic regressions even give you like 90% accuracy and the in simple methods like your random forest doesn't even give you 60. So it's, it's a thing like you have to hit and trial sometimes to make sure like which model, which, which uh, specific parameters will work best with my model. And yes, I can share the slides. I'll just like, after this presentation, the five minutes, I'll just like add them on this chat link. And yeah, do you have any other questions? Then let me know. Okay, there, there, there are two more questions. Do you use unsupervised learning to select group and then run A-B test? Uh, I mean, why make it so complicated? Just like use a simple statistical test and just like run it. I mean, the more complex you make things, the more complex it will get. Of course, you can use unsupervised learning algorithms to do your A-B test. It's always possible. And how do we attribute the effectiveness of various indicators to the nodes? Uh, how do we attribute the effectiveness of various indicators? 
I'm not sure what what do you mean by various indicators here? To the nodes on the user journey. Is it like uh, you mean like the market funnel? At what stage we are looking for? So if that's the question, then um, how do we attribute them? That's something. Mm, we can attribute something like, we can, we can create some stages like uh, we can have a simple hash map maybe. Just like say like okay, this is the this is the market. This is this is the stage. This is the other stage. Another stage. Keep it simple, and at every single stage, you can have those parameters, those conversion rates, and everything. And you just like map them. Okay, at this stage, we're losing this, and how we can we make it better in the next one? Um, okay. is, is it is it uh, this is it? Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thanks to the speaker Neuraji for giving us a wonderful talk today. Perfect. Let's give it a. Let's give Neuralgic a big round of applause. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for joining, bye-bye.